I'm growing in God's love. I am making a difference. Give the Lord a hand. Go ahead and be seated. And would you open your Bibles? Would you please open your Bibles to the book of 1 John chapter 4 and Ephesians chapter 3. If you go to 1 John chapter 4, we'll start there. So you can put a marker in Ephesians chapter 3. Put a marker over there in Ephesians 3 and we'll start in 1 John chapter 4. Uh, I'm on a series that we, I'm calling Draw Near to God. There's three parts. This is the third part. We're ending it today. And what we have, we've been on a fast now. We started a fast, uh, was it two Sundays ago, 14 days ago? And we, we've asked people in our church to participate in a 21-day fast. It's our annual fast that we do in September. We take the Sunday following Labor Day and begin 21 days of prayer and fasting. And this year, what we are fasting about is drawing near to God. Drawing near to God, getting close to God, getting next to God, getting closer to God. We're using this scripture, James 4, 8, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. And the first week I talked to you about this scripture and went on and, and shared with you the first couple of steps of how you draw near to God. And last week I talked some more about it. But I wanted to say on the fasting, first of all, I'd just like to thank how many people are involved in the fast. There's a lot of people who have fasted either from one day to all, um, all 14 days now. We're day 15. Um, and if you are doing any kind of a lengthy fast, make sure that you do break your fast slowly. So I just want to give a little caution on that. Don't, don't fast for 10 days, then all of a sudden think that you're going to go out and have a big plate of spaghetti and meatballs because you will die that night. <laughs> so, you know, um, be careful. If you've fasted for any length of time, your stomach has gotten a lot smaller. You need to put food in it slowly. You need to put it in, in, in a right order. Start with just some raw vegetables and move slowly over. Take three days to break that fast. Just don't jump, you know, jump on in. people. The, the funny part is when you're fasting for any length of time, whether that's one meal or three days or 13 days or 20 days, you'll be thinking about, gosh, when I get done with this, I'll be so glad to have that. And you know, when your fast is done and you're back on normal, you could care less. It's just not that big of a deal. You know, when you are hungry for God, it's more important than food. And we've been fasting because we also had a, a word from the Lord a few months ago that God's going to be doing a fresh move of his spirit in our nation. And we as a church want to participate in that. And in that prophetic word that came, the Lord talked about those that want to participate and have to do it through prayer. And they have to be open and have to be willing. And here I'm also, I, I use the word prophetic because it was a prophetic word, but it made me think about tonight. Tonight at five o'clock is our very, very first God encounter service. And what, the, all, what that service is all about, it's about people are saying, you know, I want an encounter with God. I want more than what I have in life. I want to get closer to God. I, I would just like, I'd like to grow deeper. So that service is designed for believers to go deeper in the spirit, deeper in the, in the move of the spirit. It's going to be deeper in worship. There's going to be a little longer worship. Uh, it, it's going to be approximately an hour and a half. The service is going to start at five, be over right around 630, somewhere in that, that time period. We know because people have to get their kids home to school and it would go longer if God showed up, if he walked in and sat on the thing and he said, I want you to stay. I don't think anybody would leave in that kind of a case, but here's what it's all about. We're seeking God. We're seeking God and we want to do more. Like that testimony that Suzette read, we want to see that happen more and more and more in the streets, out in the community, because that's a big deal. It didn't happen at the altar. Those are, it's a person that's been healed multiple times by the hand of God through prayer and for people believing and praying for. We want to see God do that more. I want to see God do that through you. And so the Sunday night services that are once a month on the third Sunday of the month are designed to help you do that, help you be tooled and geared in that direction. So today we're going to go continue on drawing near to God and he will draw near to you. I introduced uh, last week to you or the first week, actually, the big question or the big requirement. We must believe that God loves us. That is too general. I like to put it this way. I must believe that God loves me. I must believe that God loves me. I think it's extremely important because the grace message is based off of the love of God. 
If you do not understand the love of God, you will not understand the depth of the grace message. And if you don't understand the depth of the grace message, you will miss more than half the stuff God has for your life. You will miss a whole lot. But the one, the one revelation that is extremely important is for people to believe that God loves you unconditionally. That he absolutely loves you unconditionally. So I want to talk to you about uh, love overcomes fear. Last week I introduced to you the thought process that if we are, or if we are in a complete revelation of love, if we totally, completely understand and there's no more room for growth of the love of God in our life, then we would have zero fear of life. There would be no fear in us whatsoever. It says in 1 John chapter 4, verse 18, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear ha involves torment. But he who, who fears has not been made perfect in love. And so what, this is, what John is referring to in his, this wonderful, powerful chapter of this tiny little book, at the end of the Bible, there's this little book, 1 John, only a couple of chapters long, and it's not very many words at all. You could read it in a couple of minutes practically. You know, you're talking five minutes, you can read the entire book. But it is so powerful and packed with truth and revelation of God that can change your life. Taking this one verse for a moment, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. If we have perfect love in our life, we would have no fear. And I asked you this question last week. I asked you a bunch of questions. Do you have fear? Do you have fear of flying? Do you have fear of driving? Do you have fear of falling? Do you have fear of darkness? Do you have fear of finances? Do you fear the future? Do you fear retirement? Do you fear savings? Do you fear your career? Do you fear you won't get a better job? Do you, are you afraid? Is there something you're afraid of? If there's something you are afraid of, it's a sign that you aren't weak, but that you have room to grow in the love of God. In other words, you can absorb more of the understanding and knowledge of God's personal love for you. Because if we are perfected in that personal love, there'd be no fear. There'd be no fear of death. There'd be no fear of sickness. There'd be no fear of our career. There'd be no fear of people. There'd be no fear of crowds. There'd be no fear of meeting somebody brand new. There'd be no fear in our life. Pastor, I don't think we can live fearless. Then John is a liar. And the Bible isn't true. Because he says here, there is no fear in love. That is a factual statement, is it not? Then he says this, perfect love casts out fear. And so what I'm trying to communicate, if there is some fear in our life, we've got room to grow in the perfect love of God. And it is not, it is not how you love people. We've always, we are so selfish. We always make everything about us. It's about how much I can believe. It's about how much I can tithe. It's about how much I can pray. It's about how much I can do. And we think if I do more and do more and do more and do more, then I'm going to get more from God. And it's not by what you do, it's what he did. And because he did it, we get it. But you only get it if you believe it and you only can believe it if you accept it and you can only accept it if you understand that God did it for you and God loves you. God absolutely loves you unconditionally. You cannot make God love you more. There's nothing you can do from this point for eternity to make God love you more. You cannot make God love you less. There's nothing you can do that God would, call, that would stop loving you. He's not going to love you less because of something you did. Why do you make it about you? Why don't we make it about him? He is the one that has come into our life and he's the one that has redeemed us. And when it talks about perfect love casts out fear, it doesn't mean you. And I've heard so many sermons about the love of God that have been centered around people and your behavior than around Christ and his behavior and his compassion in his heart. Most of these scriptures that talk about the love of God in the Bible 
Most people look at, okay, I better be better. And if I love people better, then I will sense the love of God. No, you've got it wrong. You've got the cart before the horse. The trailer in front of the car. Wouldn't that be weird if you were on the freeway and you saw some car pushing a U-Haul trailer? But yet, what we need to understand is if we accept and understand and comprehend the love God has for us, then, we're, then we can share something that we have. See, a lot of people are going out trying to love other people to get God to love them, and you can't love other people. You can't give them something you do not have. You're supposed to receive the love of God for you, and then you share it with others. You have to experience first, and then you can do it. If you have not experienced it, you cannot do it. If you don't accept it, how can you share it? One day when this long fast is over, there'll be time for sharing a meal again with other people. But when you have people over your house to share a meal, it's usually because you have a meal there to share. So you did something to prepare the meal. Now they come over and you're sharing it with them. How can you share the love of God if you haven't accepted it, if you don't believe it, if it's, you're not convinced about it, if it's not grounded inside you? You're not going to be able to do it. So 1 John chapter 4, verse 18 also says this, because fear involves torment. Have you ever been in so much fear that you feel tormented? I know a lot of people have. And fear does. Fear left alone and let it grow, it will always produce torment. God did not bring you into his kingdom to have you tormented, but have you redeemed, to have you released and free. And he says here, but he who fears has not been made perfect in love. If we have fear. So let's go to 1 John chapter 4 and let's look at this and a, and the, a few verses ahead of it and see what it says. Look what he says here in verse 16. We are at verse 18. Let's jump up to verses, verse 16. And we know and believed the love that God has for us. God is love and that he who, he who abides in love abides in God and God in him. How many people have ever heard the phrase, the Bible says God is love? Right? Well, we just read it in one verse, right? Did you know it's only listed in the Bible two times that God is love? It's only twice in the entire Bible. The phrase, God is love, is only, in, is only found two times in the Bible. And did you know both times are in the exact same chapter of the same book? They're both in this chapter. John says it twice, that God is love. Verse 8. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Verse 16, and we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love. John is the one that's trying to communicate us to us about the love of God. But let's look at verse 16 again a little slower. And we know and believed the love that God has for us. You have to know and you have to believe the love God has for you as an individual the love that God has for you. So let's think about this for a moment. Is think, did Jesus die for your sins on the cross? Did Jesus die on the cross before you were alive? Does that mean that Jesus died for your future sins? Does that mean that Jesus died for the sins you are going to commit in the future? See how weak that got? Wait a minute, wait a minute. Are you already forgiven on you about your future sins? Yes. How many times have you heard somebody preach the gospel and when they preach the gospel, they're communicating, you must get your sins forgiven. You must get your sins forgiven. You must get your sins forgiven. Well, the Bible's not communicating that you have to get your sins forgiven. You have to receive your sins forgiven. Right. There's a big difference. Christ has already forgiven you. But the Bible, I don't know why we have made sin the issue of salvation when it's not sin at all, it's death. When Adam and Eve committed sin against God, they died. And Christ told Nicodemus the answer, you must be born 
again. That's a life issue, not a sin issue. Go a little bit deeper and really rack your brains right now. When you got born again, your spirit on the inside, your spirit, soul, and body, your spirit on the inside was recreated in the image of Jesus Christ. That spirit has no sin in it. That spirit has never sinned. That spirit cannot sin. That spirit is alive in Christ. It's sin free. God deals with you from the inside to the outside. He's connected to you through your spirit. He has a covenant with you because you have accepted Jesus Christ in your, in your life, in your, and he's your Lord. Therefore, there, you are connected and sinless. And God is now working to remove sin from your physical body, or at least for you to control it while you're on this planet, for you to restrain from sin, for you to remove it, for you to become godly in your body for you to be God-like, for you to be Christ-like, for you to move forward. And here's what he says about the love of God, because you're going to find that if you accept the love of God and understand the love of God, you will have an answer to grace, which is the answer to sin, which gives you the power, empowerment to overcome sin, which gives you the ability to do the will of God and gives you the ability to go in life without condemnation. Verse 16, and we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love and he who abides in love abides in God. Now, the abiding in love, and I've heard this preached many times throughout the years, and people are saying, see, you've got to love God. You've got to love people. And if you're not loving people, if you're not being kind, if you're not loving people, then you're not abiding in God. That is not the love that it's referring to. It's referring to you understanding and grasping the love that God has for you. Again, you must receive God's love in order for you to share it. Does God want you to love people? Yes, absolutely. The phrase love one another is found throughout the Bible and in this book again multiple times. But how can you love someone else if you have not been loved and you are empowered with love? You need to have love to share love. So many of us are out there trying to love the world, but we have never accepted the love of God. It's hard to love people when you don't think you're loved because you're loving them on an empty tank. You've got to grasp and understand the love of God. Look at verse 17. Love has, now this is going to blow you away. This is one of those mind-blowing verses. Love has been perfected or comes to maturity or comes to its completion or full among us in this. Now he's going to tell you how you get perfected in love. By being kind to people? No, look what it says. That we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he, Jesus Christ, is, so are we in this world. Okay, let's put it in plain English. If you want to get better in love, if you want to get more mature in love, if you want to accept more of the love of God, then you must believe the truth statement that as he is, so are we, but we're in this world. As he is, so are we in this world. Is he sick? No. So are we in this world. Is he injured? No. So are we in this world. Is he depressed? No. So are we in this world. Is he broke? No. So are we in this world. When you start to grasp and understand that God is trying to communicate to you that you are in Christ and what Christ has done and achieved has been given to you as a gift of grace. And if it's a gift of grace and we have to learn how to receive it, and if we believe that as he is, so am I in this world, it says that I will mature and perfect the love of God. But yet I've been told all my life as a believer, in order for me to get better at loving God, I've got to go out and be nice to people. Years ago when I first became a pastor, and my nat natural bent, my, my wiring is to be an introvert, very introverted individual, uh, like being alone. Um, I recharge my battery by being alone. I don't recharge my battery by being around a bunch of people. An extrovert gets all charged up. An extrovert, they'll go to, they'll go to church and they'll communicate with everybody, touch people, talk to people, and they'll go to lunch and they're all wound up and they're just, wow, it's just like I got charged. I, you know. And uh, introverts, they'll go to lunch and they collapse. They say, wow, that was a lot of energy. There was five people. And I remember, you know, praying to be a good pastor and, be, and wanting to, to love people. I was trying to give love, but I didn't believe that God loved me. 
And I remember trying to give love, trying to, trying to be nice, trying to be, trying, trying to be nice to people. And it just didn't work. It just was an empty tank sharing nothing with someone else. Not until I started to accept the fact and believe in the love that God has for me and find out through grace, through the act of God's grace, I am loved, that I started to fill my tank up with love and started to share it with people and found it so much easier to love people. And I look at people and I appreciate the things that they have done and what's going on in their life. And life starts to change and you become more Christ-like. But it comes through perfecting in the belief that as he is, so are we in this world. Look at again at verse 17. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, so are we in this world. What's that mean in the day of judgment? And so I'm not afraid of God. Why? Because he's the one that delivered me. He's the one that brought me into his family. He is the one that has rescued me. He is the one that has saved me. He is the one that has healed me. He is the one that's working in my life. I accept him for what he has done for me because as Christ is, so am I in this world. And if I continue to meditate on that thought and think about it again and again and again and again and again, as Christ is, so are you in this world that I am like him because he made me like him. Look at verse 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. What love is it referring to? The acceptance that you are like him in this world. The acceptance that God has made you into something special. In other words, the way you fill your love tank is accept it and believe that God has delivered you. And quit looking at your faults, quit looking at your shortcomings, quit looking at your sins and start looking at him and that he paid for it. That he has paid for it. And that you are now going to be able to be far more loving because you are being loved. You are being loved. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been, has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. It's the second time he says that in the same chapter. He says it a little bit different in verse 10. Look what it says. In this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. In other words, the payment, the buyout, the one that brought us into his family. In other words, the more, the more I concentrate on I am delivered. Why? By the grace of God. I am set free by the grace of God. The more I think about what he did for me in the, on the cross and me being in Christ, what, the more he did for me by who am I? I am as he is, so am I in this world. In fact, this verse is so important that starting next Sunday, I'm going to begin a four weeks uh, message, sermon message series on you in Christ, being in Christ, who you are in Christ, so that you will understand this verse better and grasp it so that you can grow in the love of God. Because if you grow in the love of God, you will grow in the grace of God. If you grow in the grace of God, you'll have the ability of God and you'll begin to move forward and be more powerful. So there is, there is hope for your fear. If you're afraid of something, by us understanding who we are in Christ, if we know our position in Christ, our place in Christ, who we are, if we identify ourselves with Christ, fear starts to lose its control in your life. So what I'm telling you, there is a day that if you will meditate on the, th on the love that God has for you, there is a day that you will have that fear removed from your life. You don't have to be afraid. You don't have to be overwhelmed. You don't have to be afraid of demons. You don't have to be afraid of people. You don't have to be afraid of stuff. You don't have to be afraid of money. You don't have to be afraid of losing your life. You don't have to be afraid. But it comes from you growing in God's love for you. Accepting it. So, well, I, I believe God loves me. Yeah. I believe that you believe that. I believe that you believe that. What I'm saying is, if you have fear in your life, then maybe you have room to grow. I'm not saying that you don't believe that God loves you. I'm saying that 
it needs to go deeper, which takes us to the next portion of this message that's found in Ephesians chapter 3. Would you turn to Ephesians chapter 3? Ephesians 3.20 says this, Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us. Now, I, I think this verse is pretty cool. Here's a promise from God that he wants to do exceedingly abundantly above all that you can ask or think. I can think pretty big. I can ask pretty big. Can you think big? Can you ask big? Well, he wants to do exceedingly abundantly. Well, exceedingly abundantly is, per, is a lot bigger than my thinking. Exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think according to the power that works in us. Do you know what that power is? It's three things. Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these is love. Again, when you hear sermons preached about faith, hope, and love, we always make it around us. How much faith do you have? How much hope do you have? How much love do you have? It's always about us doing something. Versus understanding that faith is a gift of God. God has given you faith. You have faith. Hope is also a gift from God. It comes from the Holy Spirit. It's found in Romans chapter 5. That the Spirit of God doesn't, you know, He brings us hope. He gives us hope. And love, it's not, again, you outwardly playing and working and doing love. It's you accepting. If you accept love, you will love people. You will love God and you will love people. That's why the Sunday night, our God encounter service, is for people that are growing in the love of God. And they want to just express their love to God through worship, through music, through lifting of our hands, through some times of just being quiet and still before the Lord. They want to just be there. They want to get prayed for. They want to be ministered to. They want to hear the power of God, the presence of God. It's about growing in that power. Faith, hope, and love. But now let's look at this. I want to share with you that the power that is going to change and do exceedingly abundantly above all you can think or ask is going to be found in the love that God has for you. Ephesians chapter 3, let's begin at verse 16. Here's what Paul says. That he would grant you, this is God the Father, would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man. So he wants you to be strengthened through might. That Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width, the length, the depth, the height, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly. So let's stop there and let's look at these Bible verses for a few moments because I'd like you to grasp and understand them and really, really um, get to know what they are because I call this the love prayer where Paul is praying that you will understand how much God loves you. That's what this prayer is about. And this prayer covers several things. One, that the Holy Spirit would give you might. Number two, that your faith would be in Christ. Number three, that you would be rooted and grounded to the point where you are comprehending how big God's love and comprehending is a very, it's a weak word because in the English grammar, when you think of comprehension or you think of comprehending, the first thing that comes to your mind is understanding. And that's not what the word means in the Greek. So we're going to have to understand what that is. Number four is to know the love of Christ. Now, he wants you to know these things and the result should be in you being filled with all, all the fullness of God, that you'd be filled with all the fullness of God. So let's go back to verse 16 and look at it a little bit. Here's what he says, that you would be grant, that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might, underline the, underline the word might, to be strengthened with might, that you would be strengthened with might. Well, the word might here means ability. And the word ability would be a better translation than the word might. The word might makes you think of power. But ability means that you are, you've got something that you can do. And he's saying that his prayer is that you would be strengthened with ability. My definition of grace is God's favor and ability 
to do his will his way. God gives you favor and he gives you ability. And Paul is praying here that you'd be strengthened with ability. How many of you ever had the question, God, well, how do I do that? How do I do that? How do I do that? I remember the first time, and we're in Ephesians, in the next chapter it says, husbands, love your wife as Christ loves the church. That's a good one to say, how do I do that? How do I do that? Well, here is a prayer where he says that he wants you to be strengthened with ability from your inner man. He wants you to be strengthened with ability. In other words, God wants to give you the ability to do what you are asking to do. Some of us are asking God to do something and we don't have the ability. And the ability will come from the love of God. Ability must come from grace. Grace must come from love. You must accept the love to have the grace to get the ability. So let's look at it some more. Here it says in verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love. He said he wants you to have faith in your hearts in Christ, that you are trusting in God. You are trusting in Christ. Well, what's important is for you to understand root, being rooted or, or uh, grounded. Rooted means to, to go deep, to keep going deep. It also means that something that you have to understand that you cannot pull your roots up and change soil. In other words, that you've got to be grounded, rooted in the love of God. In other words, you continue to grow. You know how trees, the, the roots continue to grow, continue to grow, continue to grow as the tree goes taller. You've got to keep growing in the love of God. In other words, if you want people to see the love of God on the outside, then you've got to grow on the, in the soil of Christ and grounded. And the word grounded means to lay a foundation, to lay a foundation. You are to be rooted and grounded in love and not the love you have for others, but the love that God has for you. He wants you to be rooted in this. Look what he says. I want you to be rooted and grounded in love. Rooted and grounded in love is, do you believe that Jesus Christ loves you? Do you believe? Again, it's surface talk when we say, oh yeah, I, I believe God. Yeah, Christ loves me. Oh, that's so great. Oh yeah, he loves me. He loves me. Did his love change for you when you sinned? Not at all. Okay, let's make some up. You got Christian Joe. Joe Christian. And through a series of events in his life, he starts flirting with some lady at, ch at work. No, at church. Church is better. He starts flirting with some lady at church. Next thing you know, they're in the same small group. Next thing you know, they're sitting next to each other in that same small group. Next thing you know, she has a prayer need. And only he can understand his true prayer need. And next thing you know, they're in a hotel room and they're having sex. And the following Sunday, they're at church, worshiping God. One on one side of the room, other on the other. They keep looking at each other and not thinking of Jesus at all. Does Jesus love them less? Did they lose their salvation? Are they going to hell? You'd be surprised how many people think that, okay, they get in the car, they drive away, they crash, die, but they went to hell. Oh, I'd love to get into that one. But here's what I want you to understand. God doesn't love them less. He loves them the same. He hurts for them. He will send people into their life to rescue them. He sees how they're really hurting a lot of people. And he sees that this is a good journey and a good path to be on, and he'll do everything he can to get them off that, but he doesn't love them less. He loves them the same. So you, you're driving on the 91 freeway. You're not driving. You're on the 91 freeway. <laughs> you're in the driver's seat. There's a steering wheel in your hand, but you're not driving. Okay? And you're on the 91. And it's just, it's just, I mean, I'm going faster right now. <laughs> and it's just, it's moving. And tempers are, 
are, you know, are getting in it. And you realize it's crawling and crawling and crawling and you have to go to the bathroom. And you're not sure what you're going to do. You're contemplating just wetting your pants because there's no way off anywhere. You're not sure what's going to happen. And, and just stuff takes place and you're, you're, you're cre- moving over, moving over, moving over the lane and you, you're about to get to this off ramp and make it, you know. And you're, you're coming, coming over there to an off ramp and you're just about to get to it and somebody cuts you off, just cuts in front of you and you cuss them out. Just you cuss like a, a good Christian cusses. <laughs> And you're using words that are explicit. You're using that word that's a noun, a verb, an adjective. (laughs) It's used in every form. Does God love you less? But how many times you'll leave that scenario and you feel like God loves you less? You will feel ashamed. You will feel what did I do? Oh, that was horrible. Or you caught yourself in some kind of a sin and you feel like God loves you less. You need to know God doesn't love you less because God is the answer for your feelings. He's the answer for your deliverance. He's the one that's going to change you. He's the one that's going to help you and grow you and, and develop you and perfect you. It is the love of God that you need to grow in. How much God loves you. That God absolutely, absolutely, absolutely loves you. I told you that my wiring is an introvert. My wiring also, just my wiring and my battle that I deal with all the time is believing and fighting and understanding. That's why God put me on a journey to research grace for 15 years. Is fighting that I'm accepted. Always don't feel accepted in the eyes of people. Always wanting to feel accepted. Uh, would for years and years and years say something stupid or do something stupid all out of the fact that I want to be accepted. But as I grew in the love of God, I started realizing he has accepted me. So I don't care what you think. <laughs> He's accepted me. That's not to be mean. I don't care what you think. It's mean that it shouldn't be part of the equation. It's not part of my equation. I, my identity, listen real close, My identity isn't in my sexuality, my political position, my um, age, my age bracket, my career. My identity is I'm in Christ. I am in Christ. And if I'm in Christ, then I'm loved of God. And that's what's important. Let's wrap this up. Look at verse um, 18 again. And here's what he says. You want to be rooted and grounded in love that you may be able to comprehend. The English word, as I told you, this word for comprehend means to understand. It really, the word should be attain. That you may be able to attain with all the saints. What is the width, the length, the depth, and height? It's not comprehension only. The word goes deeper. It even goes beyond attaining, but it has to do with receiving, taking hold, grabbing, and exercising. Actually being able to do it. Know it. Do it. Live it. Get it. Grab it. Have you ever shown somebody how to do something on the computer and they say they understand? And then you say, okay, sit down and do it. And they can't do it because they haven't attained it. They haven't grasped it. They haven't taken it. And once they're able to, once you have ownership of it, then you have, according to the Greek, this word for comprehended. And he says that I want you to realize, and here's what he says. This is amazing. He goes, I want you to realize how wide, how high, how Actually, this would be, this would be your wide. This would be your width. What is it? The height. There's four of them. I only have three. The height, the length, the depth. This is the length. This is the width. This is the height. And the depth is to go. That the height height goes as high as you could possibly imagine. The depth goes as deep as possible. He's trying to say, will you get into the cube of the love of God? Okay, imagine a cube and the cube floats. And the cube's enormous. 
and you just step into it and you're right in the middle of it. <laughs> and all around you is nothing but the love of God. Have you accepted the love of God where you've actually felt it in a worship time? You felt it in a prayer time where you felt God's love. Isn't it a great thing? But you can't live by that because when you have the opposite feeling, you think he left you, but he hasn't left you. He's with you. Jesus made that bold statement commitment. He committed himself. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. If he is with you, then you need to realize the way that you grow closer to God, to draw near to God, is accept his love that he has for you. Because you know all the junk about you. You know everything bad about you. You know everything that's, all your mistakes. Am I right? Nobody needs to tell you and they always try. <laughs> you already feel bad enough. Thanks for making me feel just as bad or worse now. I thought I hit it, but now everybody knows. But you already know all your trash. God knows all your trash. And he says, I love you. Because inside, your, inside you is that recreated spirit that he's working with. That you are his. He bought you. You belong to him. And you know what? God's proud of you. And God wants to say to you, thanks for being one of mine. Thanks for believing in my son. Thanks for taking his name into your life. And thanks for telling other people about me. God loves you. God cares about you. God wants to work in you. God wants to help you. God wants to bless you. As he is, so are we in this world. Let's close our Bibles, turn off our devices.